All right, so I'm Chris Brogan, and I'm here with Mark Ostrovsky, the uh, um, author, the New York Times bestselling author of Get Rich Click. So I had to bring my iPad in because I didn't have the copy of the book sitting out. It's in my car. Mark, you, we were just talking beforehand about the fact that, you know, you've been in some other fields before and that this is sort of like, you know, new tools for some old games in some ways. Can you talk a little bit about the old days and we can work into where it goes next? The old days. <laughs> Remember 10 years uh, ago? All right, I told I told you that I'm turning 50 this year. So I've been around for a long time. Uh, I founded the prepaid phone card industry years ago. And before that, I was very involved in the startup of the, of the uh, uh, private payphone industry and the deregulated telecommunications industry. So I've gone through a lot of startup industries and I look for and seem to be fairly proficient at finding the niches, understanding what's missing and providing the information about the sellers to the buyers and the buyers to the sellers. And in this case, uh, I, I've kind of taken an active role in the industry because it's kind of a fun industry and an awful lot of money, an awful lot of money is being made by individuals with the tools that are out there to do that. You know, so we have that in common, by the way. I worked in the wireless prepaid industry. So not the, not so much the prepaid phone cards, but when they started shifting from using the cards to admin, it's to wireless specifically. Um, but I wasn't in any way the founder of it. I was just, you know, a humble servant of a uh, wireless services company. Uh, so I, I profited differently than you. Um, we are at a spot where, you know, the social media thing is really popular. Everyone knows about it. And, and in a lot of ways, your book is sort of saying, yeah, but because there's this on there's this that's come before it and there's this you know there's this way you're doing it and there's this other way you can do it what what kind of first attracted you to the whole social media thing and, and what did you start to see that you know made you decide i think there's a little bit more to this than just silly kids talking to each other on facebook well i'd say two things are 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 interesting about your comment one is social media is just another way of building a mailing list irrespective of they're your friends or they're your business friends or they're your contacts, it's another way to build a list. And if you look at it from an unemotional standpoint, it's a list. It's a list. Now, depending on what, you don't want to sell your friends all your stuff, but it's a list. And you almost have to take the emotional side out of it to uh, really understand how to use it from a business standpoint. And in that respect, you add on the power of the internet and the technologies are out there and understand the background of network marketing. And what you've got is an automated income stream that's tied to the network marketing concept that can be incredibly lucrative. And to that end, I look at and teach in my book how people make money with Facebook, how they make money with LinkedIn, how you make money with YouTube and a number of other platforms. They're all, if you really take out the emotion, Chris, and you know this, you've got multiple ways to create multiple lists and you have to approach and sell via those lists in different ways. You don't want to sell a stagnant product on a YouTube and you really can't sell a YouTube product on a medium that won't accept video. So you got to look at each medium and they're all growing irrespective and independent of one another right now. It's kind of interesting. It is. Um, so I would say that some number of people, when they heard you say, just think of social media as another list, on one side, they're probably shivering a little. They're saying, Ugh, you know, I, I think of this as my friends. These are my close personal uh, connections and stuff. And, you, and your, your point is that, yeah, sure, you can look at it that way. Or if you're looking to use this thing to do business, this is this is what I know how to do, and this is how I'm doing it. What um, what early experiences did you have with that? Because I've got to imagine that when you sort of stumbled into the kumbaya aspects of it, I'm sure it wasn't really very well received. And then how did you kind of adjust from you know, wow, I'm hitting this a little too hard, to okay, this is kind of how they do it, but I can still make business happen. What, how did that work for you? Well, I'm not actively marketing products because I don't need to do that. The products that I'm selling are separate from my social media contacts. Hmm. I literally use social media for social purposes. Other than promoting, I was on the TV show The View, or I have an article in Time Magazine or Time.com about personal things, which are what social media is, is used for often. I'm not selling actively on it. I learned from others how they're doing it. I'm a researcher and I research how people are using technology to better their business. And then I report, similar to you, 
ways people use technology to make more money, lower their cost, and automate a process that can be automated. So with that in mind, we know that LinkedIn is much more of a business-to-business -business social network. So you can approach a LinkedIn client in a very different way than you can approach a Facebook friend or a YouTube video follower. And you have to, it's a sales process. You have to look at each one independent of the other and say, what's the nicest, politest way to let people know what's going on? So you could say, uh, I read about a guy who's selling this product online and it's really cool because here's what he did to sell it and apparently he made a lot of money and here's what he's doing. The inference is if you can do the same thing, anyone who's an active inter uh, entrepreneur is going to say, wow, I could apply that over here and make a lot of money in the same way. Exactly. And, and, and without beating it in their head, say you need to do the following which is what a lot of the infomercials and the hard-hitting guys are doing. Mm -hmm. I'd rather give them case studies the way Harvard teaches and say, here's a case study of someone who did X, here's what they did to do Y, and here was the results, Z, and see if they can, over time, after hearing enough of ways people are doing it, say, you know, I could do that. Mark, in Get Rich Click, uh, one of the things I thought was kind of interesting is you, you did go through, I mean, quite a history of ways that people make money on the net. And, I, you know, I don't know that, and again, when we joke about the old days and history of, we're talking like, you know, 10 years ago sometimes. But, you know, the the mindset of e-commerce, you, you kind of, you touched e-commerce, you did a lot more in search, and then you did a lot more in, say, like advertising and paper action, affiliate marketing, which I'm, I'm interested in for sure. Uh, and then in chapter eight, we went into uh, domain names. And so one of the things I was going to say was I, I kind of liked the idea of, um, you know, your mindset there because you had, first off, you had some kind of funny stories in there that I liked about domain names that you didn't, uh, you just couldn't get, people weren't loving it the way you wish they would love it. So you want to talk about that a little and then just, I guess, maybe talk about some of what your thinking is in that space? It probably helps to give them a little background that I have some understanding of the domain name space. Right. Uh, you want to do that? Or you want me to do that? No, nah, you go ahead because it's your story and I'll blow it and I'll be like, you you know, own such and such and I'll be totally wrong. I got in the domain name space in 94. So what is that? Seven, 16 years? Yeah. That's amazing. 16 years. Jeez. Um, I bought a but My sister was a researcher at University of Texas and taught me these things that are domain names and they're interesting. So I started buying them up. And in the process, figured out there were four markets that I really liked. They were the same that appear in every newspaper. News, weather, sports, and business. Business was my love and my passion. And teaching business is something my sister did at the University of Texas. My father did at the University of Houston, both professors. So I looked at buying business.com because it was used by a telecommunications reseller in Europe. I ended up buying it for $150,000, which at the time, no one had done anything even close to that. And I had a company that was in the domain business helping companies register domain names internationally. So my first company in that, it was idnames.com. And I ran it with a guy named Pinky Brand. And Pinky was my best friend at the time. And we were in college together and what he had done was came in to run this company and we our first comp our first client was literally uh let's see our first three clients were mcdonald's aol and harley davidson and we registered their names in other countries so we wanted to take this opportunity when i purchased the name and figure out how can we get some free publicity out of it so we released to the media that a buyer it was me bought a domain name for one hundred and fifty thousand. And the press went crazy. How stupid can you be? And one headline actually read, a fool and his money were just parted. And they just didn't get it and they wrote about it. Believe me, they wrote some terrible things. But the company got a lot of publicity because it said the company registers names, which was our goal. Turned out that it wasn't such a bad purchase. I sold the name in 99 uh, for 7.5 million, which landed in the Guinness Book of Records. So I've done a lot in domains, probably 20 or $22 million 
in buying and selling of domain names. With that said, there's still opportunity to make money in the domain space. It's just a lot harder. It's not the walk around and pick up golden nuggets. Literally, before you called me for five minutes ago, I was looking up a domain name to see who owned it because I want it for a company I'm working on. So in that respect, they had it marked at $5,500. And of course, the first thing you always say is, that's ridiculous. Are you kidding? You want the owner to know that's a ridiculous price, irrespective of what they say. So no smart domain owner is going to go, oh, that's a great price. I'll take it. This just doesn't happen. So you never make the first offer if you can help it. It's one of the pet peeves. And never know who you are or why you want it. If you're a big company, the price adds a zero. Right, right. You know, that's that's good advice I didn't take a little while ago. I guess I should have called you about a year ago when I was looking for this domain that I ended up not buying, but I certainly made it seem like I needed it badly. Um, so another thing you talked a lot about was uh, content is king and all that. And, you know, we've heard it a bunch of times, but you're pointing it out that there's a lot of business to be had in it. So if you were somebody who... If you were, I don't know, coaching someone who is a blogger type, the, the type who's making a lot of content but isn't making a dime from it, I mean, what's, what's sort of your add-ons? Like, what do you do to sort of get them moving from, you know, really good person who uh, types a lot to good person who can make some cash? Well, I like to talk about two things. Um, one is reverse, a, a term I created for the book called reverse e-commerce. You don't have to own products anymore to sell products especially with the internet. What I mean by that is we own a company called blinds.com and it's not a promotion for them. We don't need it. I'll explain why. The company does 80 million in this year we'll close out a little over 80 million dollars. Wow. We did 70, 74 somewhere in there this year. And we sell mini blinds, one off custom mini blinds and window coverings. We own zero mini blinds. Zero. We have no product, no inventory, no warehouse. We simply run a really good website and have a really good back end that is automated, outsourced, and drop shipped. 80 million. Now, you don't have to make a lot of percentage points to make some decent money at those kind of numbers. And the reason we've gotten so big is we're very inexpensive, but we have eliminated the headache of product and expense of product and warehousing and distribution. We outsource and drop ship the entire back end. Now I have another company called Cufflinks where I actually own the Cufflinks because the margins are bigger and we can afford to play that game. But in the world of the internet, affiliate marketing, I love. So I teach two markets to those of you who are sitting at home and saying, how do I get off my parents' couch? I wanna move out and have my own income stream. And that is, you can own some, You can sell something you don't own, just make sure that they have it in stock, and then go sell it, collect the money, then buy it and ship it. Reverse e-commerce. And then the other is affiliate marketing, and I go to the Affiliate Summit in New York, or the lead gen industry trade show, LeedsCon, I think it's called, isn't it, Chris? I think so. And those two markets are very ripe for people who can sell without owning a product. Affiliate, we all know you simply get a code and promote the code. So for those of you who know how to build lists and build Twitter lists and Facebook and YouTube and, 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 and any other social medium, you simply need a code. And you say, I bought this product. It's really cool. Here's the code if you want to see it. If they buy it, you make money. Now, it doesn't get any easier than that. You don't handle the product. You don't handle the money. You just get a commission. And you use a third party. You're, a lot of people say to me, how do you know if someone bought the product that I'm going to get my commission? I don't know how to tell. And most of these guys don't do it themselves. All of the affiliate management is handled by a third party company, right. whether it's a clickbank.com or a commission junction. They handle it so they're not out to screw you because they don't get paid unless you get paid. So you don't have to worry about not getting paid very often. And uh, affiliate marketing and lead generation are two really, really cool markets that people can make money at, even with no money. 
which is a beautiful way to start. So in, in wrapping this up, one of the things I wanted to say is that one of the things I liked a lot in your book was that you did a lot with QR codes and you had a URL all over the place. Make sure you swing by getrichclick.com slash digital premiums, blah, blah, blah. You had like all kinds of links all through the book. It was like the most active book, you know, going as far as that goes. Um, one, I imagine that was fun to tell your publisher, I, I intend to do this. I'm sure they just kind of shrugged politely and said, oh, okay. And then two, um, did you get a lot of interaction? I guess you'll say yes, you know, no matter. But I mean, what was the interaction like with people who did or didn't touch anything off the book? You know, it's funny. I don't know the stats, so I can't say yes. Okay. I don't know the stats on how many people clicked on the codes. I do know it got me on the view because I got to talk about a book that's on the New York Times bestseller list with a QR code and explain what that is. And that hit got me 10,000 books sold. So whatever. You'll uh, take it. I, 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 in the old days, I took voicemail and I took a magazine that I created on voicemail and explained that in, in every ad, I took a one page ad, which let's say was $5,000. And I put a code at the bottom of the ad so you could call an 800 number, punch in the code for that ad, and hear more information about that advertiser. I look at QR codes as the identical scenario. You can take a passive medium, whether it's an advertisement or a, a billboard, which I've seen them in Times Square, right, right. or a book, and put a QR code and turn the passive medium into an interactive medium. And that's really what's fun. We're at the very genesis of what can be done with all these technologies when you marry them or put one on top of another. And the opportunity exists to get in, understand, use it, and see where you can push the limits that others aren't doing because they're going to put a QR code on the back of a Rolex watch because you, I literally saw a QR code on a watch box so I could see how they made the watch. And it was very cool because you realize, wow, there's a lot of effort in hand making a watch. And what they did is very, very simple. So you're going to start seeing QR codes on an awful lot of things. And then there's technologies like five digit short codes, which people don't even know what they are. And I just came from the National Speakers Association. Chris, you're a speaker. Mm -hmm. Do you use five digit short codes from the podium? I don't. All right, so when you get off the podium, here's the, to the audience, we're gonna take one of the world's experts and we're gonna show you how even the experts, myself or Chris, don't use the technology that we understand because we never thought to apply it. So watch this. Chris, when you get off the stage, mm -hmm. now I'm interviewing, right? Right. When you get off the stage, people rush the stage and hand you their business card, correct? Sure. sure. You take the business card home, you either give it to your secretary or you scan them and somehow you get them into your database. Right. right. Then at some point in the future, you think I'm going to send something to them and you send them a copy of your slides or your presentation or a giveaway or would you like to blank? Right. All right. When I get off the stage, I have every phone number and email address in a database and they've already received that information before I leave the stage. Now, here's how that works if you want me to in short order. I'm on stage. I say, if you would like a copy of my presentation or X, Y, or Z, whatever I want to send them, it's already set up, send it your five digit, the, send your email address to the following five digits. So they enter the five digits in their text, they hit send. I capture their phone number and their email address. I then automatically, the software that does this, sends them the data. I use a company called Redfish Media. Okay. And they automate the whole process. So before I leave the stage, I have everyone's phone number and email and they've received the information. You, on the other hand, do it what I consider the old way, which is 99% of the market. Wow. And so when I explain this to people at NSA, they're just like, wow, because they can immediately figure out the benefit of how to apply that technology to their situation. And that's really what I'm doing. I've applied it to mine. It works. Now I can explain it. Right. I like to do things before I tell others because I want to make sure they work. That works. Makes perfect sense. And on that, we'll wrap. Mark Ostrovsky, the author of Get Rich Click, the New York Times bestselling author of Get Rich Click. And we can see you at getrichclick.com. It's probably the easiest place to send them for now, right? Yes, sir. Super. Well, thanks so much for your time. I appreciate it.
and when and I get to interview you in the future. I think we'll do that. It's a fair trade. Fair trade. Thanks, Mark.